Here's what we do. Now this is going to throw you, I guarantee it. Okay, let's take, uh, let's take outhouse, whatever. And in a traditional year, guys, if we do a cross-sectional, I'll just kind of do it like this, a traditional year, uh, if this is a 30-foot break here, and then you're going off this way into the abyss, and then this is your shallow shoreline up here, and this is cross-sectional, okay? Here's how I come into this thing. I come into here, and this may be, you know, the, the casino, when the water's right, there's a spot that's 10, 11 feet out here. Okay, so this may be a flat that doesn't touch the shoreline. Just keep that in mind. All right, here's what happens, guys. I come in with my boat, and I park out here in 40, 50 feet of water. And a vertical jig master, I am not. Okay, I want to cover some water. If I get on top of a school, then I, maybe I'll park over them, but I like to cover some water. I'll camp out here, we're using a blade bait, whatever. And I toss here, and I'm trying to hit that break. And I let it go down to the bottom. Little thing about blade baits, push it to the bottom. Once it hits, you rip. None of this weenie, mm. okay? It's a rip. You're gonna be cramped here if you're doing it right, I promise, okay? It's gonna wear you out. Rip it up. Push it back to the bottom. Pushing it means keep it tight, because well, they're gonna hit it when it's dropping. If you do not react, as soon as you feel that tap, forget it, it's over. They suck it in, they realize it's not real, and <laughs> okay? Here's the story. I cast out, hit the bottom. Rip, drop, rip, drop, rip, drop, rip, drop, rip, drop, rip up, I hit a fish right here. Huh, okay, that's interesting, great, cool, it's a three pounder, we're in the right spot. Then I throw out again, and maybe two or three casts later, I'm ripping, 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 boom. Same place, the line's getting underneath the boat when I hit the fish. I say, boys, reel them up, we gotta move. What do you mean? We're on a fish. Yeah, but we're coming over here. Park the boat on a 30-foot break. Now I go this way. What this is telling me is that this school is still down in here. And if you know how to use your graph, you'll see it. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Okay? By repositioning the boat in and casting out, I'm keeping this bait in the strike zone for a longer period of time. As I start to hit fish getting closer underneath my boat, I now reposition out here and cast in. Okay? Moving to stay with them. What's going to give you the biggest percentage? I know they're parked down here. I'm hitting them on the very last rip. Position the boat, cast out to deep water. Not a lot of guys do it. Now, as the day progresses, this is what happens. Casino flats last year, guys, not this year because it's been horrible down there. Chad and I fished down there, what, about five times, Chad? Okay, my partner in crime. Chad, big fish, Kaiser, big walleye, Kaiser. We've got a 16, 14, 12 and a half, whatever. 10s, 11s, great. 8s, 9s, whatever. There were 17 boats came through there in those five days. Not one person caught one fish. And I say that not to impress. I say that to make a point. Okay? They come in. This is the 30-foot break. Chad and I are wherever we're positioned at according to the day and what the fish are doing. They come in. They say 30-foot break because everybody says 30-foot break. They drop down the old spinner. <sighs> pass me a beer, Fred. Pass me a cookie. Pass me chips. Da -da 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 -da. One pass, and they're gone. Okay? I got one question. Yeah, John. You're talking about casino flats back now. Right. Do you start to get shallow? What, what do you consider deep? Deep for me, and this is... A, Guys, and that's why I was going to get to the thing about getting skunked, okay? I don't fish over 40 feet, guys. I don't fish over 40 feet, okay? And the reason is this. Bob, all your big fish come out of? 40 or less. John? Uh, for the most part, around 10 to 15, 16 to 18. Exactly, okay? And we're going to get to moving shallow, but I want to talk what these guys are doing. I, these guys catch big fish, guys. Okay, I've seen them. They're not as good as me. <laughs> They're a lot older, so they must be. No, all jokes aside. Okay, guys, understand the basic principles of a fish biology. Okay, if I was standing at the front line of the Boston Marathon and I had a number one shirt on, you'd go, huh? where's he running to, the donut store? Okay? How many marathon runners are built like Burl? None? Okay. 
I have a lot of muscle mass, no stomach, I'm fit, okay? That muscle mass requires what? Oxygen. When you climb up the boat ramp, like we talked about earlier, when you get to the top of the boat ramp, you're going, oh, should have sent Bob up, he's a lot fitter, <laughs> right? Okay? Understand this concept, guys, this is so important. I, I, I did a seminar at the boat show, or at the, the, the Great Western show, and I said, how many of you guys have caught a 10-pound walleye in over 80 feet? And a couple guys raised their hand, and great kudos, okay? It's not going to happen that often for you, and it's a basic concept. Here's your surface. There's 100 feet. I know guys, don't tell John Race about that, but the 120-footers, you turkeys, no, John's a good friend of mine. This is the deal, guys. And the reason why I learned this is because I had a guy who had a PhD in biology and he has a degree in water talk to me about this. It made a lot of sense. Okay, and I learned this lake trout fishing as to why we catch the big fish down there and why we don't catch them anywhere else. Here's what happens, guys. You all know what stratification is, right? Thermocline, you've heard it? Okay, here's what happens. And this is a, if you buy the subscription of the Angler's Experience, there's over an hour about this. Okay? Okay, now up in kettle and stuff, guys, you're not really going to have this happen because the whole mass of water is continually moving. As you go lower down and it starts to back up in the summertime, this starts to happen. So understand that, okay? Thermocline is this, guys. You have an upper layer, epilimnium, thermocline, uh, hypolimnium, that's your lower. Upper, lower, and middle. My mother. Okay? Upper, <laughs> upper, thermocline, and lower. Thermocline is this, guys. Think of it, it's 0.5 degree change in temperature per foot for a small two, three foot window. It's a temperature change, but more importantly, it's a density change in the water. Okay? What that is saying is this, guys. How many, uh, Go out to a lake and do you see weed growth down 30, 40 feet? Usually 30 feet's the max, right? Your cabbage beds, right? 30 feet's the max. It all has to do with phototrophs. Sound like I'm educated. Okay? A phototroph is an organism, be it a uh, you know, plankton type or plant. Phototrophs, if they were not here, we would not be here. Phototrophs. Wow! <laughs> Phototrophs, guys, take carbon dioxide and light and turn it into oxygen. In the water, it's dissolved oxygen. In the air, it's the oxygen we breathe. Phototrophs. Below 30 feet, guys, you're not getting tons of light penetration. Phototrophs no longer exist. Okay? This thermocline happens in the hot part of the summer. Typically around here, you'll be 30 to 50 feet, somewhere in there. You can find it with your graph. It's a whole other seminar. What happens here, guys, is this density traps copepods. Fancy word, huh? Those are your organisms that live in the water. A copepod does not have a swim bladder like a fish. The swim bladder controls your up and down elevation, okay? Copepods simply get stuck in the densest column of water. Rainbow trout and stuff like to feed on the copepods. All your bait fish, copepods, okay? What's happening here, guys, is this upper 30 feet is where the environment, wind waves and such, is affecting the water column, which is creating the oxygen. Top 30 feet. When you start to go below this, the oxygen level goes, okay? Depending upon the species and size and mass and such, an optimal oxygen content is nine parts per million dissolved oxygen. Not baffling with numbers, okay? Nine parts per million. If I run up the stairs, I'm going to breathe hard. I require more oxygen, okay? As you drop down, guys, down in this level down here, you could be three, four, five parts per million, okay? Most guys, when they fish down there at that depth, catch ratfish. 
A bigger person requires more oxygen, more muscle mass. A smaller person does not. What happens is these fish come up into this and feed, guys. They go down to here and rest. Let me use this analogy. In the heat of the summer, all right, my wife cracks the whip. Get out and mow the yard. Whoosh. Yes, dear. You get up and you start as soon as you can because you know it's going to be 100 degrees out, right? You do your work. 10, 11 o'clock rolls around. You're sweating to death. You then retreat into your house. If you have a basement, you go downstairs. If you have an air conditioner or a fan, you sit in front of it, right? You want to cool off, right? They came up and they did their work and fed. They in turn went down here and rested. It's a resting zone, guys. It's a resting zone, not a feeding zone. In order to chase something down, what does it require? Oxygen. Not enough oxygen here. Does that mean you couldn't drop shot a leech in 180 feet and catch a big walleye? Yes, guys, if you presented it and it happened to be in the right, maybe. Okay? This is not the feeding zone. Big summer walleyes, guys, are tough for this reason. Some of your best walleye guys in the summertime are trout fishermen. They're out here trolling 70, 80, 90 feet, trolling the thermocline, whatever, if they're marking fish. They're trolling for what Mr. Walleye wants. Okay? Open water stuff, nomadic, spread out. Okay? These guys out here, well, I had a guy come to one of my seminars and he said, oh, it makes so much sense. He's out there catching, you know, 10, 12, 13 pound walleye, not a bunch, but throughout the summer he's having this happen. And he's got a flasher and a fly for kokanee. And he says, Seth, it's every time I pop it off the release in 80 feet and I bring it up. Well, you're bringing that flash and flutter and thing right through the zone where they're feeding at. It's all it is. It's all it is, guys. Now, when you have turnover occur, that is a time when you may catch a big fish down deep like that. Here's what happens with turnover, guys. How are we doing on tape, Chad? Here's what happens at turnover, guys. When water starts to get below 50 degrees, it becomes dense. It starts to get denser because it's cooler, right? Remember we taught thermocline? Here's what happens. You got your thermocline here. Now you're going into September. The uh, water's getting cooler. As this upper mass cools, guys, what happens is it sinks like this. Turnover can only go down to about 250 feet in optimal conditions. What in turn happens is when turnover happens, you will know immediately because you will go out and the fishing will be ridiculously tough. As that water drops like this, everything becomes a, con a constant temperature. What was in this upper layer up here? Lots of dissolved oxygen. That's now fluttering all the way down through the system. That's why turnover fishing is tough. Everybody goes turnover while well, the weeds came up off the bottom. Well, that's just because when a phototroph does not receive light, even at nighttime, okay, it starts to produce carbon dioxide. That's why when we bass and pike fish in the fall, we try to find green vegetation. Brown vegetation is consuming oxygen. It's creating carbon dioxide. Okay? So understand that. And then there's a thing called inverse stratification, guys, and that's more about ice fishing and stuff. And what that means is that the, the warmer water's down below, the colder water's up the top because it's starting to be affected. Okay? Understand that when water gets below 39 degrees, it gets lighter. That's why your ice cubes float. That's a unique property of water. Okay? So getting back to the 11-foot thing okay, that these guys are talking about. Remember how I said I started out deep? Now, there's guys out there catching them in 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 feet of water, guys. And this is one of the reasons why I won't do it. And it's a thing that I have that I just, I despise and I hate. And if there's some of you that do it, I apologize for being mean to you. Guys, go out and catch those fish. If you want to go out and catch your food fish, get your limit, great. When you get your limit, you put your boat on a trailer or you start fishing shallow. You're done. Okay? Guys, haul those fish up. You're bringing them through atmospheres, guys. They're descending. Okay? They're bloating out. That bloating is an increase in the swim bladder, okay? Bring them up. I see these articles about fizzing, and I just want to, oh, man, okay? If you take a balloon and you jab a needle in it, it deflates. You blow that needle back up, what happens, or blow that balloon back up, what happens? It leaks, 
okay? We're not a biologist. Don't go poking holes in them, okay? What happens is this, guys. If I take somebody smaller in the audience, and I grab him and I squeeze him or I lay on top of him or I apply a massive amount of pressure, what happens? It gets hard to breathe. You're compressing the heart. You're compressing the lungs. As you're bringing those fish up, guys, you are taking oxygen from their brain. When they're pushed out like that, they can't breathe or function. That's why they lay there. Okay? You have damaged that fish internally. internally. Whether you poke it or not, it's over. You may poke that fish and it takes off. It's going to go right on down to the bottom. Because when it tries to inflate the swim bladder, it's just going to leak. Okay? That's why I don't go out that deep. Okay? I respect nature, animals, whatever, guys. I'm not a nut like it. You know, about don't get your limit. Go ahead. But I hate when guys just keep pulling them up, pulling them up, pulling them up. It's been a big problem at the kettle tournament. Go down there a couple days later and there's fish floating. Okay? Because they bloated them on the way up. Don't do it. Okay? The bigger fish are going to be up shallower. Now let's get to this. We all right, Chad? Okay, guys, remember how I talked about the break? And up here it was 11 feet. Okay, 11 foot and this was 30. Okay. Fish are what? Fish are what? Cold-blooded? You and I are warm-blooded. Understand that. These fish, guys, in order to get energy, what does a fish have to do? Increase the temperature of its blood. Right? Because they're cold-blooded. Here's what happens. You get up on these shallow spots, guys, and you'll see the good guys casting right up to the shoreline. If the wind's blowing like this, and this is the shoreline, and they were out here, and it's blowing into here, you'll see them casting to the shoreline. You go, what are those guys doing? There are no fish there. Those big females, guys, pull up here. They get right up underneath the surface, so they get right along the shoreline. Okay? Two things are happening. On a bright, sunny day, and this is what's going to throw you off, on a bright, sunny day, the water's warming up. You're seeing it on your graph. What you're seeing, guys, is six to eight, nine inches, ten inches of water warming up. That's it. That's why when the sun starts to go down, it drops fast. Okay? All you're seeing is that infrared warming that surface up. Now, as this starts to push this way, and if it starts to bang into a shoreline, mixing occurs. Okay? Mixing occurs. Liberty Lake, I'll give this to you an example, the other day. Back end of the bay casting for brown trout, this would be the southwest corner, down in here. Surface temperature was about 40. Down on the graph, which is down, you know, that far on the, on the front of my electric motor, it was about 38 degrees. The wind was blowing this way. Over on this side of the shoreline here, which would be where the boat ramp is at, which would be the northwest, or northeast, excuse me, Surface temp was 43 degrees. Down here on this, more importantly, it was almost 41 degrees. It's pushing up in and it's mixing. Okay, on a lake, if we were talking about bass, I'd tell you to always go to the northern side shoreline. That gets more sun because of the southern angle of the sun. Your backsides like this are shaded by the mountains, so this is shaded. This doesn't receive that nice, warm, southerly breeze. Okay, same thing with this. This gets pushing in. Those fish come up, guys, and they're sitting here. They're trying to get any amount of warmth they can to increase the temperature of the blood. Okay? The other thing that happens, and this is why they come in at night, guys. Understand this. How many of you have seen the movie Jeremiah Johnson? My favorite movie. Have you all seen it? When the old boy tells them to heat the rocks up and put them in the ground and sleep on them? Remember, he catches the bag on fire, la, la, la. reason why he did that is because what? Rocks retain heat. Okay, they're coming in here to utilize that. They come in at night because I tell you, they're laying up there in a foot of water, guys, because those rocks have been warmed all day. Okay, gaining the heat. So you always move in, guys. Their, light, their eyes are extremely light sensitive, but when the urge to get warm is calling, they're going to take it over the hurt to the eyes. I promise you that. That is a big mistake. People in the wintertime try to flee from the light. Start deep, go shallow. Go back out. This right here, guys, is between 10 and 1 o'clock most times. Okay? 10 and 1 o'clock. At nighttime, it's between 8 and 11 o'clock. Is there fluctuations in there? You bet. Okay? All our big fish last year, between 10 and 1. Like clockwork and 11 feet of water. All right?